I'd like to spend just a few minutes at the top talking about why I'm here, just give you some background. But then I really do, I'm looking forward to having a discussion between the two of us, but I am really looking forward to hearing from all of you. So please don't be shy. I always tell audiences to do me a favor and show me respect by asking me your toughest question. And I mean that because if you're thinking of a tough question, there's a good chance somebody else might have the same question. And I'd much rather get that out in the open and give me a chance to answer it than have you leave wondering what the answer is. So I do mean it. When we get to Q&A, please fire away. So I'm the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Let me tell you what that means. The Federal Reserve is the central bank of the United States. Our job is to kind of manage the economy from getting too hot and too cold. And we'll talk about what that means. But if you go back to American history, our nation has always hated the idea of having a central bank at all. Alexander Hamilton created the first central bank. It lasted a few decades and then Congress got rid of it. They said, we don't like the idea of these bankers in a dark room doing God knows what with our money. We just don't like it. It sounds un-American. Well, then in the 1800s, our economy, the US economy, kept getting hit with financial crises, including a really big one, the banking panic of 1907. And then Congress said, well, we don't like it, but I guess we need to have a central bank. But if we're going to have a central bank to manage these ups and downs, we don't want it all housed in Washington, DC, with this power all concentrated. So they said, let's create a distributed central bank with what's called the Board of Governors in Washington, DC. There's seven of them, appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. And then there are 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks scattered around the country including one in Minneapolis, including one in Chicago, one in Cleveland. And the Minneapolis Fed is meant to represent the Ninth Federal Reserve District, which includes Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, part of Wisconsin, and the UP. So you're in my Federal Reserve District. And my job is to get out across our region with my colleagues who are here to know what's happening in the local economy so that when I go back to Washington, D.C. eight times a year, and we set monetary policy interest rates for the country, I'm able to speak intelligently, hopefully, about what's happening here in the UP, what's happening across our region, and bring that local perspective back to Washington, DC. So in many ways, my job is to hear from and represent you. That's why I'm here, to share with you what I'm seeing, but more importantly, to hear from you what's happening here in your community, what's happening in the job market, what's happening in the local economy, what are the strengths, what are the tough challenges you're facing so that I can be as knowledgeable as possible. Now, what do Federal Reserve Banks do? We have a number of different functions. I mentioned one, which is monetary policy. So we help set interest rates for the country to manage the ups and downs of the economy. Congress has given us what we call a dual mandate. Mandate number one is stable prices. That's not too hot, not too cold. Mandate number two is maximum employment. That means as many Americans who want to work are able to get a job. And we try to balance these two things to try to achieve them both. We also regulate banks to make sure that they're not taking too much risk and make sure that they're providing credit to credit worthy borrowers. We also provide services to banks. So if you go to the ATM and you take money out of your account, that cash probably started out in our vault because we have truck, brings trucks that travel all around the district sending out fresh cash to banks, bringing old cash back. And that's why you've got in your chairs little bags of shredded money. That's real cash that a machine looked at and said, it's going to be rejected for some reason. We don't get to keep it. It goes through a shredder. If you can put that money back together, God bless you. You're welcome to. Um, <laughs> good luck with that. It's going to be tough. Those are small pieces. So those are some of the things that the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis does. We do economic research. We do outreach. We've got Ron here who helped set this up just to get, a, get to know what's happening in the local economy. Um, so that's, that's the big picture background. Some big initiatives that we've taken. I've been president of the Minneapolis Fed for a year and a half. One big initiative that we took on last year is the issue of too big to fail banks. We saw in 2008 when the financial crisis happened, we had to bail out the biggest banks in America. I was at the Treasury Department helping to run that program. So I'm responsible for that in many ways. We hated that we had to do it. It was the right thing to do. We never want to do it again. So we came up with a plan to say, how can we make sure that never happens again? We can talk about that. The big banks don't like us, but that's OK. Uh, we have to do what's right for the American people. More recently, we, more recently, we announced a major research initiative focusing on economic disparities. 
there are a lot of disparities across our economy. There's racial disparities. There's rural urban disparities. Some of these disparities are decades or longer in the making. We're trying to analyze them to understand what can we do about them? What are the root causes? What can we do to try to give everyone a chance at good economic opportunity? So that's a major research project that we have underway, which I can, I'm happy to talk about as well. And so that's a lot to dump on you in a few minutes. That's a high level of why I'm here. The things I'm most interested in hearing about when you ask me questions or when you offer me comments are, how's the local economy doing? What are the challenges? What's the job market look like? I met this morning, I've been here all day. I visited the UP last year for the first time. This is my second visit. I heard overall the economy sounds like it's doing better than it was a few years ago. Uh, businesses sound like they're doing pretty well. There's a lot of optimism among businesses. Generally, businesses reported to me that they were able to hire workers that they needed. By the way, that's different here. When I travel around the district, a lot of businesses say they can't find the workers that they need. So it was interesting to hear businesses here say, yes, they were able to find the workers that they need, which means that there's either, or maybe a combination of factors. There are a lot of skilled workers here by virtue of the university, and maybe this region is catching up more slowly than some other regions, because some other regions are saying they're having shortages of workers. So it was interesting to get that flavor here, but I'd love to hear about all of those topics and whatever else. So let me turn it back to our, our wonderful host. Okay, so, so one of the things based on what you just said that I think is important for everyone here is that we do struggle with relatively low employment rates in this area and also low wages. And I think when I first moved here in around 1990, um, the mines were just really shutting down and that was a major employer in the past so that that source of employment went away and the university is a major employment employer here the hospitals are major employers and there are some businesses coming up some new high-tech firms but it's not really growing as quickly as many of us would like to see so you know you mentioned that people are looking at this, that this is a research project. So what are some strategies to promote economic development? Well, th this is a, uh, first of all, this is a common problem all across our region because there's a lot of rural communities and they've generally seen their population shrink over time. So in many ways, I think this region is better off than a lot because you do have the university, which is a huge, you know, it attracts people from around the country or around the world, it develops talent. So that's a huge advantage that you have relative to most other communities. So you've got that going for you. I'd say it's not easy. The, the communities that are doing better have this kind of an anchor that you already have. And then I've seen that there can be a very strong partnership between the local business leaders and the local civic leaders to try to make the community as attractive as possible so that when your young people grow up, maybe they stay here for college, maybe they go somewhere else for school, that they find it an attractive place to come back to raise their families and to continue to reinvest here. So I, from what I've seen, I think you have a lot going for you, and I would just say there's no easy answer. It's continue to do what you're doing, continue to try to invest in the, in the region here to make it attractive for families to want to stay. Um, I've also heard over and over and over again that electricity prices are a huge challenge in the UP, uniquely challenging here in the UP, and that is a challenge for businesses to be competitive. If it's a, if it's a power intensive business, if you're paying triple the electricity rates, boy, it's really hard to compete nationally or globally when that's a factor. And so that's where your state and your federal legislators probably have a role to play in addressing that. Okay. So I, I, I believe from reading about you um, that although interest rates have gone up in the recent past, you have not been supportive of that increase in rates. And so I'm interested to learn more about why you haven't supported those increases. Sure. So uh, in March and in June, the Federal Open Market Committee that I'm one member of voted to raise interest rates by 0.25% at a time. So interest rates are still quite low, but they've been going up. The reason I voted against it, and I published a long explanation, which is on our website if you're interested in the details, is that if you think about our dual mandate, stable prices and maximum employment, when I look at the data, I've seen that there seemed to be slack, some room in both fronts. We weren't overheating. Now, the job market nationally has gotten tighter in the last six months. The headline unemployment rate in America today is 4.3%. It's come down quite dramatically. Now, that ignores people who've given up looking and people who are stuck in part-time jobs. But even when you look at those folks, the numbers have come down a lot in the past few years. So that gives us confidence that we're getting closer to maximum employment. 
But at the same time, inflation, which is how our price is growing in the economy, has come, been coming up lower than we've been targeting. We have a goal of 2% inflation per year, which is we don't want it to be zero because if it gets into deflation, it can be very costly for the economy. So we want very low inflation, but steady inflation. And the US, like many other countries, has been experiencing low inflation, lower than we expected. And so since we aren't seeing inflation coming up to our target, let alone getting to high levels, basically I'm saying, what's the rush? Why are we trying to cool down the economy when there may still be some slack in the job market and there's still some room to run on the inflation front? And so that's why I voted against those rates. And in the last couple months, instead of inflation climbing back to our goal, it's actually been falling. And so that's kind of a conundrum. The economy is sending us mixed signals. The job market is getting stronger, and yet inflation is ticking down. You would expect the opposite. The way it's supposed to work is when the job market gets tight, businesses have to compete for workers. And they compete for workers by outbidding each other, which then leads to higher wages, and then that leads to higher costs, and that leads to more inflation. That's how we think it's supposed to work. But we're not seeing wages climb very fast, and we're not seeing inflation. That tells me the economy is not on the verge of overheating. So can you explain the other perspective? Like, why do some people want to raise the interest rates? What's their argument? Uh, <laughs> I've, I've not found a very compelling argument. Um, the, the argument is there's a fear that maybe inflationary pressures are building that we're not seeing in the data, and that one day maybe we're going to wake up and be surprised that we're behind the curve, the economy's overheating, and then we're going to have to raise rates really quickly to get it, cool it back down, and then that itself might tip the economy into a recession. That's not crazy, but I'm not seeing any signs of that in the data. And so I'm saying, let's look at the data, let's look at what it's telling us. If we're not seeing wages grow quickly, we're not seeing inflation grow quickly, I don't see what we're so worried about. So I'm going to ask one more and then sort of open it up to the floor. So um, I believe that the Fed worries mainly about monetary policy, but we hear a lot in the news about fiscal policies, and so I'm wondering if you can kind of just explain the difference between the two. Sure. So um, when Congress created the Fed, they, over time, they and the executive branch did something really smart, which they said, let's keep the Fed independent of politics. So the Fed, you know, um, I, I feel for them. When members of Congress go and give town halls like this, you've seen what's been happening on TV. You know, they get shouted out. Whether they're Republican or Democrat, it's pretty intense. People get really angry. One of the nice things about the Fed is we're strictly religiously nonpartisan and nonpolitical. And so everything I'm here to tell you today is just based on the economic data that we look at. There's no partisan agenda. And that's why people are probably less angry at us uh, than they are if I had a, a, an R or D next to my name and we're advocating a partisan message. So Congress said, Fed, you're going to be independent. We're not going to get involved in your monetary policy decisions. You, need, you, the Fed, need to try to manage the economy, the ups and downs, strictly based on our reading of the economy, not to satisfy anybody's political agenda. Now, contrast that with fiscal policy. Fiscal policy means your and my tax dollars, how much taxes you and I are going to pay, and then what those tax dollars are going to be spent on be it healthcare or defense or education or infrastructure, those are fiscal policy decisions that our elected representatives make on our behalf. And people have very, very strong opinions about how much we should be taxed and what that money should be spent on. So that's a clear separation between monetary policy, managing interest rates, and fiscal policy, which is inherently, those are political decisions. And that's the separation that we try to observe. So we can't influence, if you say, hey, your taxes are too high, I'm the wrong person to tell that to because we have no influence over what your tax policy is. All we're trying to do is manage the ebbs and flows of the economy to keep it from overheating or to keep it from stalling out. Great. So I'd like to give members of the audience the opportunity to ask a question and we have microphones. And if you could uh, introduce yourself, I'd appreciate it. Hello, and thank you for joining us in Houghton and allow us, allowing us to host you at Michigan Tech today. My name is Heather Knudsen, and I serve on the faculty in the School of Business and Economics. I hold a PhD in finance and taught courses in markets and institutions during quantitative easing two and three. 
My question involves the composition of the Fed's balance sheet following policy normalization. So not a local focus, but something I'm pretty interested in. The Fed currently holds about $4.5 trillion on its balance sheet, a sizable in increase from the pre-crisis levels of $900 billion in May of 2007. Notably, about 40% of the assets are held in mortgage-backed securities and agency debt. You see where my question is going. With the addendum to policy normalization released by the FOMC last week, we learned additional details about normalization. After an initial phase-in period, which may begin sometime in 2017, the balance sheet will shrink by $30 billion per month for treasuries and $20 billion per month for MBS and agency debt. Although the ultimate size of the balance sheet is not yet known, Governor Powell mentioned in a June 1st speech of the Economic Club of New York a scenario of $2.9 trillion, a sizable in increase from pre-crisis levels. At this level and based on the path to normalization, MBS and agency debt will constitute about $1.15 trillion of the Fed's balance sheet, about 40%, and take about three years to fully normalize, assuming no disruption that might warrant a pause in normalization. So here's my question. <laughs> Does the Fed intend on holding 40% MBS in the post-normalization period? If so, What's the rationale for continued support of this asset class? And is it within the Fed's authority to provide sector-specific support in the long run? There's a lot there. Um, <laughs> yeah. So let me, let me uh, uh, give the, the rest of the audience a little background. So the way we uh, get the economy to try to grow with interest rates, if you're buying a house or you're a business and you want to expand and you're going to go get a loan, one of the things we try to encourage you to invest more if the economy is slowing is we lower interest rates to bring down your mortgage costs so it's easier for you to buy that house or it's easier for that small business to get a loan and afford to expand. Now, the, what you really care about is you really care about long-term interest rates because if you're going to buy that house, hopefully you're going to live there for 10 plus years. So you don't just care about what's the interest rate for the next few months. You care about what's the interest rate over the next 10 years or so. So the real way that the Fed affects the economy is by what we end up doing to long-term interest rates, even though we move short-term interest rates up and down. Well, when the financial crisis hit, the Fed cut interest rates down to zero, but the economy was still on life support, still barely hum moving forward. So then were we, out of, were we out of bullets? This is before I was at the Fed, but was the Fed out of bullets? No. So then the Fed said, well, we've cut short-term interest rates to zero. Let's bring long-term interest rates down by buying up assets, buying treasury bonds, long-term treasury bonds, and mortgage-backed securities, as the professor said, Fannie and Freddie uh, mortgage-backed securities, to drive down those long-term mortgage rates to give the housing sector some stimulus to try to get the economy moving again. So now we have this balance sheet. As you said, it was around a trillion dollars, a little less than a trillion dollars historically. Now it's four and a half trillion dollars. And a couple weeks ago, we announced plans for how we're going to gradually shrink that back down. So she was asking about what's the destination? How small are we going to bring that balance sheet? And what's that balance sheet going to be comprised of once we bring it back down to more of a normal size? The answer is, so far, we don't know what the final destination is on how small we're going to bring that balance sheet. And the truth is, we haven't even decided. It's not that I'm not telling you when we have decided. We haven't decided. This is an ongoing discussion amongst all of the FOMC participants. We know the economy is bigger than it was in 2007. We know that the demand for dollars around the world is much bigger than it was in 2007. So we know the balance sheet, even if we wanted to return to the exact same policy position of 2006 or 7, the balance sheet will be a lot bigger than it was back then. But we haven't yet decided, do we want to go all the way back down to that scale or something in between? And then, depending on the size, will it end up being just Treasury securities or including mortgage-backed securities? I think, I think uh, there's a lot of desire in the country to have a Treasury-only portfolio. And so will we end up getting there? I don't know yet. But I, know, I do know that if we have to go beyond Treasuries, we want to keep it as close to the U.S. government as possible. And by buying securities that are guaranteed by the U.S. government, for me, for one, that's preferable than buying corporate bonds or some other pure private sector security, because at least the, the debt and the bonds that we're buying 
are full faith and credit of the U.S. Treasury Department. They're, they're wrapped in a U.S. government guarantee. So that's why I, I would feel comfortable if we have to go beyond treasuries to at least keep it within the U.S. government, so to speak, with Fannie and Freddie securities. Thanks for your question. Okay. Hi. Can you speak into the mic? Yes, thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Pat Hyden. I'm a chemistry professor, so um, my question should be much simpler. <laughs> um, so let me first say, uh, personally, I think you have way more charisma than the person who played you in the movie, Too Big to Fail. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Now, the, um, however, this, the other part of the question is actually two parts. Um, you know, so part of the mandate is really to regulate banks for their health, as I understand it. Um, so part A of this question is clearly before that didn't go very well. So what's different now? And related to that, um, personally, I really have no confidence in Wall Street whatsoever. I mean, there's so many different ways in which it seems to benefit an awful lot of people through various means, but ordinary people maybe not so much. And yet, where are we to go? I mean, because you can't put money in the savings uh, bank anymore uh, at all. And so I guess where that relates to you is, for me personally, I don't really feel, yeah, I, I'm saving in the stock market. It's the only thing really open to me. But I really don't want to retire because I don't trust that that will be there at any given day. So. You know, what is a person to do who is not in the top and able to take advantage of some of those other things? So, thank you. Yeah, fair, fair, uh, both very fair questions. So, there's no question the banking regulators blew it leading up to the financial crisis. And the problem is, we're going to blow it again. Yeah, because, right no, because, you know, human societies are prone to mass delusion. And if I were to tell you what's the root cause of the 08 crisis, it's a nationwide delusion that home prices only go up. Because in American history, it had never happened that the whole country home prices fell. You'd have regional downturns. You'd have San Francisco down and Boston would be up. Or Texas would be down and New York would be up. And so all the regulators and the bankers and the rating agencies and the home buyers all said, well, there's this benefit of diversification. The system overall is going to be sound. Well, when that ended up not being true, all of those fancy models blew up. And then we had the terrible 08 crisis. And so I wish we could legislate wisdom, but we can't. And so what we need to do now is put in place a regulatory framework that will work even when we're stupid. I mean, really, that's what we need to do. I mean, we, you know, it's not illegal to be stupid, but we need to prepare for stupidity because stupidity is coming. Well, yeah, but it, you're right. Derivatives and a lot of fancy products made all this stuff more complicated. And derivatives, we thought that they were going to protect us, and they made, in some cases, made the situation worse. But at the root cause, greedy people made stupid decisions, whether it's bankers or regulators or rating agencies and home buyers. You know, I was in California at the time, and in 2005, I bought a home. I didn't see it coming. And that was not a great financial decision because then the downturn happened a couple years later. So we, we have to do our best. Look out for risks. The Federal Reserve is looking out for every financial risk imaginable. But by, by their nature, you never see the risk until it blows up in your face. And so what I'm telling you is we're doing our best trying to learn the lessons of the last crisis so we don't repeat them. But let's assume the worst. Let's assume that we're going to miss it. How do we make sure the biggest banks have enough buffer so that if they get into trouble, they don't need taxpayers to bail them out again. And that's the core of the plan that we've announced. So I'll tell you, when I bought a house a year and a half ago in Minneapolis, the bank made me put 20% down. The reason I had to put 20% down is that 20% is designed to protect the bank in case I get into trouble. Because then they can seize the house, they can sell the house, they can get their loan paid off. Well, the big banks today put less than 10% down on their own investments. Well, you know what? If we made the biggest banks in America put 20% down on their investments, the way they make you and me put 20% down on our homes, we could protect the taxpayers. And so if we do that, that that's how we idiot-proof the financial system, by making sure the biggest banks have enough equity 
to protect the taxpayer so that they don't need a bailout again in the future. And that's the best answer I have for you. Now, that's not going to be perfect. There's still, it's just like building a, a, building a, a, a dike against a flood. You know, you build the tallest one you can afford. You can never protect against every flood. There could be a once in a hundred year flood or a once in a thousand year flood. You can't make it zero risk. But we can do a lot better than we're doing today. And that's what I think we need to do. And that's the plan that I've been advocating for, though the big banks hate it. Now, in terms of where you invest in savings, I hear this a lot. This is why we would like to get to a stronger economy that can support higher interest rates or more normal level of interest rates so that you could earn a decent sa return on your savings. And whether it's fixed income or treasury or your bank account, et cetera, there would be real benefits to that. But right now, the economy is growing very slowly, you know, around 2% real economic growth. And part of that's being driven by technological factors. We're not seeing much productivity growth. Part of that is being driven by demographics. Our society is aging. We're also having fewer kids. You know, one of the real sources of economic growth comes from population growth. Well, guess what? Our population is not growing as fast as it used to, simply because we're not having children at the same rate we used to in the past. So I always say to people, we have three choices. Number one, you can accept slower growth, which I'm not excited about. Number two, you can spend a lot of tax dollars to try to subsidize fertility, encourage people to have more kids. That's expensive. Or number three, you can encourage immigration. Those are your three choices. And you get to pick which of those three. That's a political decision that you have to make. Well, but as you travel around the country, there are a lot of jobs available. And so those are your three choices. Accept slower growth, subsidize fertility, or embrace immigration. That's math if you want to get to higher growth. And that, but that's for you all to decide, not for me. In the back. Uh, hi, my name's Dave Gonnigan. I'm a financial writer up in Calumet. Um, assume for the sake of argument that we get another 2008 scale crisis before you can put your grand plans into place. Um, I assume at that point the Fed would bring the Fed funds rate back down to zero. My question is, can the Fed also expand its balance sheet another, say, $4 trillion from current levels? Or would the liquidity have to come from some other source, such as uh, uh, a new issuance of special drawing rights from the uh, International Monetary Fund? Well, um, first of all, I'm hoping, you know, never say never, right? You never know. But I, there's nothing on the horizon that tells us another 08 crisis is imminent. But again, these things always surprise you by their nature. Uh, I think the Fed has a lot of tools still in our arsenal, whether it's the short-term interest rates, as you said, bringing them back down to zero. By the way, some countries have gone slightly negative. That's not our preference. We wouldn't like to do it, but it's certainly something that's in our toolkit. And then we could look at things like quantitative easing. And you know, another way that, that we operate, this is funny about economics, economics partly operates through psychology and through your expectations about what the future holds. So one of the ways the Fed reacted to the 08 crisis was about signaling to people that we were going to keep interest rates low for a long period of time. We call it forward guidance. That ends up also being another powerful tool that the Fed has in its arsenal to let you know hey, these interest rates aren't going to just stay low for a lo little period of time. They're going to stay low for a while. So I think there are a number of different tools that we have in our arsenal. Whether we could expand our balance sheet another $4 trillion, I don't know. I don't know what the limits would be in the Treasury market or in the mortgage-backed security market. Uh, but I think we would have a lot of tools at our disposal. And ultimately, if it was another 08-type crisis, Congress would probably need to get involved again. You know, when I was at Treasury, I was a, first a Bush appointee. I, won I worked under both Bush and Obama and President Obama in the US Treasury Department during the financial crisis, it was really important that Congress got involved in 2008. You know, our nation's economy was at stake. We were facing a Great Depression scenario. And our members of Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, stepped up and did something deeply unpopular. But it was the right thing to do for the country. So if we face another 08 crisis, uh, I could be pretty sure we'd go back to Congress and say, Congress, we need your help. Further, Hi. Yeah. Uh, my name is Madhu Wable. I'm Emeritus Professor from Mechanical Engineering, Engineering Mechanics. Um, Frank Dodd, uh, regulatory, bring the mic up? Uh, regulatory scheme was passed after the last financial crisis. House has just 
worked on a bill, it seems from outside look like they're about to throw a lot of what was done there. My question is, as governors of uh, Federal Reserves, uh, what influence you have when Congress is drafting new, uh, new policies regarding regulation of banks? Well, I, um, excuse me, I go up to Capitol Hill quite often after we meet eight times a year, so every six weeks, to set interest rates. And then I'll, that, the following afternoon or the following day, I'll go up to Capitol Hill and meet with elected representatives, House and Senate, uh, both parties, mostly from our region, but also from around leadership around the country, talking in a large part about economic issues and regulatory issues. So for example, the plan, we, we're not allowed to lobby Congress, but we're allowed to share the analysis that we've done. We're allowed to share our perspective on different regulatory issues. And every member of Congress that I meet with, I talk to them about, I say Dodd-Frank has done some good. It's been tough on community banks. It has not gone far enough on the biggest banks and we, the biggest banks are still too big to fail, and you need to know that, and we need to do something about that, and here's an example of some things that we could do. I'll tell you, I'm really pleased, I mean, we'll see if it goes anywhere, but I'm pleased that Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate, basically agree on two things as it relates to banks. They agree that community banks need some relief because they're getting smothered by the regulations aimed at the biggest banks, and they largely agree that we need to do something about too big to fail. So there's a lot of commonality among both parties on those points. So that encourages me. And so we do. We share our ideas. We share our analysis. At the end of the day, these are judgment calls that the American people need to make through their elected officials. And so it, their, Congress does have a very important role to play. And you know, we try to give them as much information as we possibly can. Sir. Hello, my name's uh, Ted Holmstrom. I live in Hancock, Michigan, right across the canal here. And uh, I'm a, um, an educator, an economist. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming here and to Michigan Tech, and thank you for the job that you do. And not only you, but the entire Fed. Thank you. So we really appreciate that. Uh, my question is, and I'm also a father of six children. You talk about uh, having children, so. Well done. But uh, <laughs> my wife did all the work. <laughs> Well done again. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the question I have is, you know, we, you know, obviously we, as economists, we talk about inflation and, and the, that concern, and then we talk about different sectors of our economy that prices seem to increase quite substantially, and then we always, you know, ask why. Well, the concern I have is um, higher education. Uh, to get a university education in the United States of America today, it's uh, very difficult to get through without taking loans. And uh, the uh, price to go to uh, a university just continues to rise and rise and rise. Uh, obviously, um, some university uh, encourage people to take loans. So we have a large number of um, uh, people graduating from the university with super high uh, debt immediately. Um, it, what is the Federal Reserve of, of Minneapolis's opinion? What are you seeing in the um, Minneapolis region? And then when you talk to the, the people in Washington, D.C., what do they say about this continual rise in a university education? It's a never-ending, uh, just increase, just keep on increasing, keep on increasing. It's very difficult. Three of my children are already through the university. I have three more coming through. I can tell you as a father, it's quite a concern. So I'm just interested to hear what you guys say when you talk among yourselves. Yeah. Uh, I would imagine as an economist, it's got to be a concern that all, a whole generation of people is graduating from the university with super high debt. Yeah. And you happen to be talking to uh, a at a university that's the highest, the most expensive university, public institution in the state of Michigan. So it's very expensive to come to tech. I didn't know that. Thank you. Um, well, thanks for your question. So this is, yeah, this is a topic we hear a lot, we talk a lot about. Uh, it's absolutely a concern. You know, as when the crisis hit and revenues at the states all around the country went down, basically the outlet was student loans because they cut back from universities and the, and the attitude was, nobody said this, but the attitude was, well, students can just take out bigger loans. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people, when I went to grad school, I took out $100,000 of student loans, and I've been fortunate to have good jobs to be able to, to pay that off. So student debt is a very, very real issue, and it's challenging for people to then be able to afford to buy a house, et cetera. 
Um, I think a couple things. One is, as an economist, when you increase demand for something, the price goes up. So as, we, as more and more students are flocking to colleges, we shouldn't be surprised to see the price go up because supply needs, it needs to draw more supply in. So we all need to get a lot smarter about how we're providing more access to college at lower costs. So in some cases, technology is showing some promise. Not every class can be put online, and it's not right for every kid, but some classes can, and some universities are adopting that. Some professors don't like it, but sorry, you know, we, we got to adjust. We need to meet the needs of students first. That needs to be our highest priority. So I think we need to look at more innovative ways of delivering uh, academic quality to more students at lower cost. Um, I also think that students need to be much more informed consumers. You know, a lot of students are taking out a lot of debt and then finding out, oh, this major that I found so inspiring, there's no job. Well, you know what, students need to take a little responsibility for that, for the decisions that they're making too. So I think universities need to do a better job of arming those students with the information they need to make sure that there are, or there, at least improve the chances of having a good job at the end to be able to afford to pay off that student loan. I mean, there's no question, if you look at the averages, college is still a very, very good investment for people. But it's not a good investment for everybody. And by the way, not every kid needs to go to a four-year college. There are a lot of good jobs available that may require a two-year technical certificate or degree, associate's degree, et cetera, and making sure that young people realize that and have access to that. You know, today, earlier in the day, I heard that from some of the local engineering firms that they can hire all the engineers they need. It's the welder and the skilled trades that they have a tougher time hiring, which I found very interesting uh, as well. So I think that this is a complicated problem, and we can solve it, but it's going to require a, a pretty focused effort over a long period of time to get there. I just have to jump in here, Please. too, because um, I, I would argue with you that we're not the highest in the state, but that's a whole <laughs> other discussion. And from the university perspective, one of the most difficult things for us has been that we used to get a lot of funding from the state of Michigan to do our jobs, and that has steadily decreased through time. So basically what's happened, what used to be funded through taxes to the state of Michigan and then appropriations to universities has been shifted off to the individual students. So when I went to college, and I grew up in California, so I started out at community college and then a state university and then the University of California, I paid very little for my education because the taxpayers of the state of California paid for most of it. And if I were to go to school there now, I would be paying for more of it. And I think back then the rhetoric was, well, it's good for the states to invest in the education of their young people because when those people grow up, then they will have high paying jobs and pay taxes that will replenish the pot. And so it's, it's a really difficult problem, but students today are being asked to pay much more of the real cost of education than when we all went to school way back when. But does that explain the huge increases in education? Even, even if you take away all the subsidies that took place, let's say took away after 2007, if you look at those numbers, it does not explain that. There's been a huge increase in the price it takes to go to the university, whether it's subsidized by the state or by the individual itself. And so what we mm -hmm. get is we get a situation where, uh, as you say, supply and demand, but it's very difficult for somebody to graduate from the university without, now if you have the right job, it doesn't matter. Sure. But if, if you don't, and if you haven't been counseled well, you're right, it's a very difficult. Yeah. And you know, you think about the decisions that uh, young people make when they decide their major. I mean, I, I went to the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign and I studied mechanical engineering. Uh, why did I go to Illinois? I mean, I also applied to the University of Michigan and I also applied to Purdue. I was fortunate to get into all three. Michigan was a lot more expensive than the other two and I kind of flipped a coin between Purdue and Illinois. There was no, it's not a lot of science went into my thinking of making these choices that I made. It worked out fine, but it's not as though, you know, a lot of young people watch Top Chef and they say, wow, I'm gonna go into culinary school. That's not a great decision-making process. And so anything we can do to give young people the information they need to make wiser decisions, I think that that would be money well spent. Somebody else has a question. Yes, sir. I guess I have more feedback than questions. I'm a small business owner from the central upper peninsula in the trades. I'm in construction. So I have, I have three, three feedback, I guess. Uh, as I near 60, I reflect 
um, the statement over here as well that that I hate the fact that my retirement funds are in Wall Street. And I certainly wish there was another alternative because as I near the time where I need it, I, I really fear losing it and seeing how radical that is. So that, that bothers me as a, as a feedback. The banking regulations bother me as a, as, a, as a small community. We need the community banks to grow the community and they're being so over-regulated we had in our town of Iron Mountain a domestic violence shelter that needed replacement or, or growth and, and a few of us volunteers went into our local bank on a handshake, got a $300,000 guarantee to buy this building to put the carrying house in that building. We raised funds in three or four months, had it all paid off, but today we couldn't do that and, and that scares me. So, so getting that regulation, something to do to help us as a local community. Um, and then the third thing, as an employer, um, we definitely see inflation on the horizon. We, uh, and I'm in the trade, so versus not the engineers, um, the logging construction and farming, and we cannot find a body. Uh, so we've stopped taking work. You know, where we would be normally comfortable with three to four months worth of backlog we've stopped taking work, we just can't do it anymore. If we could find bodies, we would do that. So I see inflation and wages coming not too far distance because if we can find a warm body, we're going to pay them and then that's gonna ripple across the rest of the employees to get everybody on average. But we just plain old fashioned can't find them. We also see that in the past 10 or 15 years, um, the, the kids have really been driven to the colleges and out of the trades, and we've seen that coming for a while. You do not see a young mason. That's just non-existent. So we almost have to trade or trade change them. building products because we can't find the skilled trades to do that. So those are more the, the feedback items of what we're seeing on the, on the front, I guess, as I appreciate to uh, that. where we are. And by the way, so the, um, I appreciate that feedback. On the community bank point, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's very hard. I hear this all around the district. It's very hard in rural communities for big national banks to know what's going on there, to have the confidence to make loans to some one-off where there's no comps, et cetera. You do need the community bank that knows the community, that knows the people. And so I'm with you on that. And that's why part of our plan on Too Big to Fail is if you go to our website, you can read it. It's also to rationalize regulations on the community banks so that they can play the vital role uh, that they're playing. You know, on the, the point about the skilled trades, I mean, again, I hear this everywhere. This morning, we were in a workforce meeting, or this afternoon, we were in a workforce meeting of a workforce development group that basically said that there were a lot more people looking for jobs. So, I mean, I'd be very interested in connecting you with those folks because they made it sound like they have the, the people who have the will to work and some basic skills and they are having trouble placing them. And so, I'd love to make that connection and see if that there's some if we can we put people together. Unemployment, we're saying that cannot be. They, they must not want to work because of every trade across, at least in the labor trade. Yeah. We just kind of find By the way, so I was in Wisconsin a few weeks ago, and you know the national narrative from the election about Wisconsin was that there are all these uh, unemployed manufacturing, former manufacturing workers who are, have been left behind by the economy, et cetera. When I went up to Wisconsin and I traveled around, that was the, not at all true in terms of who I met. And the, the small business men and women there said, we can't find workers. And they sa I said, well, what do you mean? I mean, aren't there people around? And they said, people are choosing not to work. They said, people are choosing, they don't want to work five days a week, or they want to keep their own schedule, et cetera. It was just very interesting that the, the national narrative was one thing. And then when I was on the ground meeting with small business men and women, <laughs> the feedback I got was very, very different. So I appreciate your comments. Who is, uh, yes, sir. My name is Mark Sinelli. My name is Mark Sinelli. I'm an ordinary victim of the 0% interest rate policy. Um, I did retire, um, and I correctly predicted what you guys were doing, so I did okay. But I've got a lot of relatives on the Chicago police force, and their investment bond letters have been destroyed in their pension plans. Um, they've only got a couple of years left of uh, reserve money, and then their pensions disappear. And I was wondering what you would tell these guys whose defined benefit pension plan was wrecked with these low interest rates. What do they do? 
Well, um, first of all, I would say there are un underfunded defined benefit pension plans all around the country, which are not being, they're not that way because of interest rates. They're that way because, in, in most cases, they're that way because of demographic changes. And you have, if you, if you look at, take the city of Detroit, which got a lot of attention nationally. If you have long-term obligations of retirees and then the population of a community is declining, it ends up being the current workers can't pay for, the current tax dollars can't fund the current retirees and it gets out of balance. And so I don't know about the Chicago pension per se, but if you look around the country, the demographic trends are what are driving this. You know, think about Social Security. Social Security, when it was created, was a pay-as-you-go model, meaning current workers pay for current retirees. Well, if that ratio stays the same, that's fine. But if the ratio of current workers goes down relative to current retirees, the program goes into the red. And so a lot of defined benefit programs have the exact same feature to them. Now, I would say, back to interest rates, if you look around the world, this is where it gets complicated. The Federal Reserve sets interest rates around a trend. If you look over the last 30 years, interest rates have been gradually declining in all Western economies. They've been gradually declining because of broader macroeconomic forces, such as the aging of society, trends in technology development, trends in trade. What the Fed is doing, if this is the long-term trend, let's say over 30 years, the Fed is managing interest rates around that trend. But the overall trend is being set by broader macroeconomic forces. We actually can't influence where long-term interest rates are in the distant future. We can just affect the short-term cycles. And so this goes back to things like productivity growth. We don't know why the US economy productivity is not growing the, way, the rate that it had. For the last 10 years, it's been very low. The prior 30 years, it was much, much higher. And so I wish I had a better answer for you than to say we're affecting things on the short term, but this long-term trend of low interest rates is not actually being set by the Fed. It's actually being set by these broader macroeconomic forces. And then if you look at most pension plans that are in trouble, the demographics are what are driving that more than the investment returns. Because again, a lot of pension plans are not 100% fixed income. They have a diversified portfolio. Stock returns have been high while fixed income has been low. I don't think you can point to most pension plans and say that's just because of the Fed. Ken Summers, I, uh, former member of the Chicago Board of Trade, uh, you had an analogy that you talked about being out of bullets. Is there any argument for, as the stock market, the economy started cresting prior highs in 2013, 14, that we should have been raising interest rates at that point so that when this catastrophic uh, downturn happens again that nobody's expecting, we'll be ready to then incrementally lower interest rates at that point. And to this gentleman's point, as we raised interest rates, uh, people in retirement portfolios would have had a benefit of investing in something besides the stock market. You know, 20 years ago, you could invest in a 10-year bond for 8% and you know, continue to generate income. Second part question is with, in the university setting, we're loaning students money at five, six percent on their student loans when the overnight rate is one, one and a half percent. Is there something that the, the Fed could do to, you know, lower that interest rate? So even though the university is high in price, the students aren't racked with enormous debt when it comes to the interest on those loans moving forward. Thank you. Sure. Um, tell me, remind me the first part of your question. I started thinking about student loans there for again. First part of my question was the analogy about being out of bullets, raising, gotcha. and then yeah, yeah. Okay, being I gotcha. able to come down. Um, thank you for that. So this is one of the things that's tough about asset prices. And I have, I've written a long essay on, on financial bubbles and how to think about monetary policy in relationship to potential financial bubbles. One of the tough parts about this is everybody sees a bubble after it bursts. And most people will swear they saw it on the way up. Uh, you know, Michael Lewis wrote this very uh, popular book called The Big Short, where after the bubble burst, he picked four guys with the benefit of hindsight who happened to have been right this time. It would have been much more impressive if he picked the four guys in advance. Because on any given day, lots of people are predicting various doom and gloom scenarios. And then afterwards, they say, oh, I called it. Yeah, good luck with that. So the challenge is the cost of false positives is very high. 
1996, Alan Greenspan, the Fed chairman at the time, declared irrational exuberance. He said the stock market was irrationally high in 1996. Well, if the Fed had looked at that and said, hey, he's right, and we're going to raise interest rates beginning in 1996 to keep those stocks from going higher, that would have ended up imposing huge costs on the US economy. When the stock market bubble did burst finally in 2000, 2001, remember that? But that only led to a minor recession. It's possible that if Greenspan had said in 1996, I see a bubble and I'm going to do something about it, I'm going to raise rates preemptively, he may have done more harm to the economy than the actual bursting of that stock bubble in 2000, 2001. And that's why we have to tread very, very carefully when we think we see things overheating. Now, if we saw inflation climbing or wages climbing rapidly, we could say, all right, our goal is to keep inflation in check. We need to respond to that. But right now, the last few years, we've been very low inflation. And if we said, well, we think things are overheating, even though in 2014, in your example, there's still slack in the job market and inflation is coming in low, we would be imposing a lot of cost to the job market and to the US economy for what we think might be a problem down the road, but we're really not sure. And so the cost of false positives can be very, very high. In terms of student loans, you know, the, the structure of the student loan market is heavily influenced by regulatory and fiscal policy. So it really is out of the Fed's domain. Uh, that really is up to the Department of Education and federal policy, which are you know, driving the way that market evolves. And so unfortunately, it's not something I think the Fed could, could do much about. Hi, I'm Faith Morrison. I'm a professor of chemical engineering here at Michigan Tech. Um, I'm actually, I think, segueing on, on the more recent questions because you've been talking about things like uh, what the Fed does with its tools, its principal levers, which are interest rates um, and issues related to the employment level. But the levers aren't doing um, now what they used to do in the past. Um, we're not succeeding. We're manipulating these manipulated variables, but they're not having the effect that we expect from the historical trends. We're, um, seeing that um, things like income inequality is growing and that's an undesirable aspect of our economy. Productivity is not responding the way um, you would like. Um, and there are other things happening that we hear about in the news like automation is um, replacing traditional jobs. And even this morning on the radio they talked about um, bringing jobs back from abroad but they're going to come back automated and not be actually bringing the jobs back. So my, my overall question is, is there any big thinking going on at the Fed as to how important structural changes in our economy might be taking place, and we have to rethink our, um, our reliance on these measures and these um, tools for managing our economy. Because if it's, if it's going to have a big paradigm shift on us, then all this meddling around with these interest rates, et cetera, it's, we're looking at the wrong things. Appreciate your question. So there is a lot of long-term thinking going on. You're right, most of this conversation has been focused on the short-term uh, ups and downs of the U.S. economy, which does consume a lot of our time. But we do have, for example, in our bank, we do have an economic research department of uh, PhD economists who mostly focus on long-term economic issues. So as an example, uh, I think I mentioned at the top, we announced a new research initiative focusing on, we call it the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute, studying these long-term trends of economic disparity, economic inequality, how do we have an economy that works for everybody in our society so that everybody can get a good opportunity to participate in that kind of growth. These are, these are trends, as you mentioned, that are very, very long-term in the making and are going to probably evolve over the long term. And so we are doing that long-term thinking, though admittedly those are things that we have less ability to directly influence. And so there may be, for example, we know that automation is a factor of the U.S. economy. It's been a factor of the U.S. economy for 150 years, a very long time, and it's not going away, and maybe it's accelerating. The solution to that is probably more skilled workforce. You know, the, how do we get more people access to high quality education to get the skills and tools that they need? So the Fed can't control that. But what we can do is do the research, do the modeling, present our findings to the public in a nonpartisan, nonpolitical manner, and then hope that either state legislators or federal legislators pick up that research and take it forward. I'll give you an example. The Minneapolis Fed, before I joined it, has done long-term research on the returns to society of early childhood education. That's nothing the Fed can influence directly. 
but we did the research, we presented our findings, and the state of Minnesota has in large part adopted that and is rolling it out across the state of Minnesota, recognizing that that's a good use of taxpayer resources. So that's the type of contribution I feel like we can make on some of these long-term macroeconomic issues. We are thinking about them, though admittedly we do have limited ability to influence them. I think we have time maybe for one last question. Hi, thank you for coming to Houghton today. My name is Glenn Ierly. I'm a retired professor here, uh, from here in mathematics and from UC San Diego in geophysics. Uh, and this is a question in the direction of Faith Morrison's uh, on, on structural uh, changes in the economy and things that might be done, and partly motivated by your own proposal that uh, reserve requirements of banks be looked at carefully. And in that uh, vein, I'd like to read a quote here. A chief loose screw in our present American money and banking system is the requirement of only fractional reserves behind demand deposits. Fractional reserves give our thousands of commercial banks the power to increase or decrease the volume of our circulating medium by increasing or de decreasing bank loans and investments. The banks thus exercise what has always and justly been considered a prerogative of sovereign power. As each bank exercises this power independently without any centralized control, the resulting changes in the volume of circulating medium are largely haphazard. This situation is the most important factor in booms and depressions. Now that particular quote, being a professor, I'd, I'd be inclined to make this a quiz question, but it's not. I'll tell you, it comes from not a paper so much as really a draft, a program for monetary reform written by six uh, prominent economists in 1939, the first two of whom were Paul Douglas and Irving Fisher. Uh, Douglas, I think, is known to most economists because of the Cobb-Douglas function. Uh, I might just note parenthetically, what's less known about Paul Douglas is that after a very successful career in economics, at age 50, at the outbreak of World War II, he became one of the oldest men ever to enlist in the Marines as a private. He was later commissioned as an officer, and in the Pacific uh, was awarded the Bronze Star and Two Purple Hearts, later senator from the state of Illinois, so quite a remarkable figure. Anyway, back to the full reserve proposal of Fisher's, really. This, at the time, was deep-sixed. But it's never entirely died, and I noticed with interest that the, Internet, uh, the IMF, uh, hardly a hotbed of radical economists, very recently, 20, let's see, 2013, commissioned their own economists to do a DSGE model to study Fisher's proposal. The conclusions of that model uh, fully supported uh, all the advantages that Fisher said would accrue to full reserve banking. Uh, is the Fed considering full reserve banking? Thank you. Uh, not, not to my knowledge. Um, I think our overall you know, the issue of too big to fail is separate from the issue of how money flows through the economy. They're, they are related but very different issues. The issue that I've been so focused on is making sure that those biggest banks are not a risk to bring down the whole U.S. economy. Assuming that we deal with that, I actually think our system, our economic system generally works. Now, it's not the productivity issues that you talked about, the automation issues, et cetera, are fully separate from that. Those are important economic issues. But I think our basic functioning of the banking system, the money supply, money creation, I think it works. We know how to manage it. We, I think we know how to regulate it. Again, the discussion we had earlier, regulators are not, are not omniscient. They are going to make mistakes in the future. But it's not because of that. The mistake is going to be when banks make bad loans, they think are good loans, the regulators think are good loans, and that's the risk that ultimately can bring down the U.S. economy. I think we've got the last question with the gentleman here in the front. Thank you. Uh, Dave Mondro. Um, simplistic uh, question. Um, actually, two of them. Okay. Vast two ends of the spectrum. One is the future and your thought or possibly the Fed's thought on um, Internet currency. Okay. Um, where do they think it's going? Is it a flash in a pan? Um, could you answer that one? And then sure. I'll, I'll follow it up with my second question. Okay. Um, so the gentleman asked about Internet currency, things like Bitcoin, these virtual currencies. I'm somewhat skeptical, and I'll tell you why. So the, the proponents of Bitcoin, this is a currency that exists just online, one of the, their selling points is that they limit the number of currency units that can ever be produced. So there's no chance for runaway inflation. Well, that's all fine and good, but nothing stops me from creating my own virtual currency and you from creating your own virtual currency. And if you look back in American history, when we had very high inflation in the early 1800s, Different states had their own currencies. And so it wasn't just that New York's currency was running away. It was anybody could create their own currency. Collectively, they had too much inflation. I haven't heard a solution to the virtual currency, you know, just new types of virtual currency always being introduced. So 
Is it a flash in the pan? I don't know. Some of the technology that sits behind it appears to be interesting. You know, we're watching it. We'll see. Uh, I don't see it replacing dollars anytime soon. So what you're saying is? What you're saying is um, history is repeating itself just in a digital age. Perhaps. We'll see. It's, 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 I mean, but it's also not, we don't see it as a big risk right now. We're watching it, paying attention, but we don't see it as a big risk to the U.S. economy either. Okay, question two. Sure. Um, with QE, quantitative easing, one and two, it put much more liquidity into our economy. Um, the last time that happened, not to this degree, was the end of the Carter administration, at which the Reagan administration, uh, with the Fed's help, raised interest rates into the teens to call back. Do we foresee anything like that? We don't. I mean, that was a, a lot of people predicted that these measures that the Fed undertook, zero, you know, interest rates basically at zero, and then quantitative easing would lead to very high inflation and a repeat of the 70s. The opposite has happened. We've had too low inflation rather than too high inflation. And so we don't expect it to happen. There's no indication that it's happening. And if anything, as I mentioned earlier, inflation seems to be dropping, not climbing. We would like to get inflation back to our 2% target and hit our target. Our target is a target, not a ceiling. So it could go a little bit above or it can be a little bit below. And those are both equally OK or equally bad. So there's been no sign of that. There's been no sign of the dollar being destroyed by these policies. Uh, other countries are also, other European countries and, and Japan have undertaken similar policies. And as we start to normalize our balance sheet later this year, I think we'll be able to, under, we'll be able to manage this gradual return to a more normal balance sheet in an orderly manner. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Neil. Thank this, you very much. This really was great. It. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you so much.